The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Bob Nicholsberg. Bob is a world-class photojournalist who's done amazing work in South Asia over the last quarter century. Um, I actually first came to know his work when I was preparing for a trip to Kashmir, I think in 2007, 2008. I was just Googling around, and I came across these incredible images from the Indian part of uh, Jammu and Kashmir that Bob had taken. And I kind of just started, I think it was on the Getty Images website, and I just started following them, and then started Googling him and found all these photographs, especially from Afghanistan, but also from Iraq and uh, Sri Lanka. So I think I lost, well, I guess I gained several hours of just wandering different websites, checking out his incredible photographs. So it's a particular pleasure for me. Uh, I think Bob is probably best known for his long experience in Afghanistan, including dozens of trips since 1988. Um, I found an interview with Bob with National Geographic where he said he just stopped counting. So probably more than 50, but you know, who knows, which gives a sense of, of his depth of experience. And something that struck me about his work, and, and you can see it in the book, is its range. From really iconic photographs of warlords, to very vibrant combat scenes, to much quieter but often equally meaningful scenes of civilians caught in the path of war. And Bob's skills have been widely recognized. His photographs have appeared in numerous major publications, the New York Times, Time, Newsweek, the Wall Street Journal. Um, and his photographs have been exhibited widely, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the International Center of Photography, and the New America Foundation in New York. So please join me in welcoming Bob Nicholsberg to the Seminary Co-op. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I will go through about 40 to 50 images and then take questions along the way. I think that's probably the best thing because a lot of the early days before 9-11 Afghanistan is a little bit more remote to people. Um, but to give you an explanation of how I got there, I moved to New Delhi in 1988 uh, with Time Magazine as a contract photographer. And as India and South Asia had not really financially taken off, I spent most of the time in Pakistan and Afghanistan, which had martial law and the Soviet army still in Afghanistan. And really to understand Afghanistan, you need to have a solid background in Pakistan, since all of the CIA and the dark side of that particular event, conflict, went through Pakistan. It's still that way, and a lot of my background uh, for each trip would be a few days in Pakistan and then go into Afghanistan. But it wasn't until the Soviet army left in 1989 that we were given visas as journalists. Prior to that, it was all across the mountains illegally with the Mujahideen. And that really didn't give you much of an exposure to the urban life, but um, I decided that rather than hike for three weeks and come out with very little film, I would concentrate on the urban areas where you'd see daily life as it really is for Afghans. Uh, when I arrived in Afghanistan in 1988, the Soviets had already killed a million people. So they were not, and no one there really was in a happy frame of mind. It was very violent and very sinister. The Communist Party of Afghanistan was then in control of the country until 1992 when the, the coup happened and the Mujahideen took over. So I will begin here. This is the cover of the book, which was shot in 2001. So here we start with the Soviet army in their departure in May of 1988. This is an Afghan soldier on the left handing a flag of friendship to a tank driver. The actual withdrawal took uh, less than a year, but it finished in 1989. There are certain significant battles that the CIA and Pakistan's ISI, the uh, Inter-Services Intelligence, uh, Bureau tried to orchestrate a battle in Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan to set up a pr provincial capital. In 1989, a battle went on for six months. It failed to establish a foothold for the Mujahideen. This is a particular 
uh, remember you have the comic and the tragic all in one in Afghanistan. And I would say that it's true for a lot of civil conflicts. But I counted 11 Kalashnikovs in this. There's a little bit of vomit on the side, a stolen Russian cap from one of the garrisons that they had taken over, and somebody filming me up top on the hill there. Uh, I call this the shuttle to the front line. But it's, uh, you have to keep a sense of humor here in a very chaotic situation. This is the same battle, and if you've ever heard of the term carpet bombing, this is carpet bombing going on with the Afghan Air Force dropping bomblets over there on the left and refugees fleeing or just hiding behind a tree. Meanwhile, inside Kabul, the military academy was still active. These are military cadets trained in the Eastern European tradition. Uh, everything in sync. And as the society started to fall apart, the Mujahideen closed in on the capital. Rockets were landing on a daily basis. Uh, gradually, people defected, continued uh, displacement of refugees within the country and without. It displaced over 6 million people, 2 million to Pakistan and 4 million to Iran. So this is normal in 1989. This was a parade in honor of the communist revolution in April of 1989. And here you have a foothold in 1991, the province of Khost, which borders on Pakistan, which you can see a sliver of here on, on the right in the mountains. They took over this uh, provincial capital. This is a very unflyable uh, Antonov Prop supply plane. These are members of the group controlled by Jalal Adin Haqqani, who is still alive and had aligned himself with Al Qaeda. These are his men. They have never been on a plane before, as you can see. Uh, but this gave them a foothold inside Afghanistan with the help of Pakistan's ISI and the CIA to establish a provincial capital and really broke the spirit of Kabul government, 1991. This is the warlord Jalal Adin Haqqani. His tribe uh, straddles the Afghan-Pakistan border, which is a no-go no zone now, but with the right contacts back then we were able to get in and he does have a bit of vanity and did enjoy talking to the BBC Pashto service. The fact that we were Americans really didn't matter to him. He was a well-educated in the religious schools in, inside Pakistan, had an enormous network of, of people helping him, and was the beginning of raising funds in the Middle East and the Global Jihad Network. He's still alive. His sons are running it. Many of them have been killed by drones, but this is the Don Corleone of Afghanistan. I always wondered what was growing in the beard, but he's uh, rumored to be in Karachi in a nursing home. This is one of the camps, Zawara camp, built by bin Laden and Haqqani. This is Haqqani's territory, and it was bombed in 97 by, 97 or 98 by Bill Clinton. It's still there. happened here. Sorry about that. This, these are Afghan and Al-Qaeda members training in these camps. What's happened here? So we did not find any Arabs, and it wasn't really worth our while to go looking for Arabs in these training camps, but we did find Chinese Uyghurs, uh, Chinese Muslims that live in the northwest of China. This is a very rare photograph for many of you who may have studied South Asian politics. It's one of the thorns in the side of the Pakistan-Chinese relationship, but they're still being trained in this border area between Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
the reporter I was traveling with spoke fluent Mandarin and came up to them and barked, what were they doing there? And they really didn't want to talk to us, but they claimed that their parents had a Chinese restaurant in Lahore, Pakistan. So back in Kabul, it's still life normally going on, even though the rockets are landing from Mujahideen groups getting closer and closer to the capital. This is a Friday afternoon, a typical off day for Muslims in the Islamic world. And families would go to a park. There was a harmonium and a tabla player off on the right. And this is a traditional dance called the Atan. the local communist newspaper for sale. And in many third world countries where literacy is a big problem, you can see the man in the back reading the newspaper to a crowd that's gathered around him. So in April of 1992, the jihadi leaders all got together outside of Kabul. All the leaders except the Pashtuns and you have here a very unusual situation. All of the ethnic groups represented in Afghanistan, the Ismailis, the Uzbeks, Ismailis, Shia, Sunni, Ahmad Shah Massoud in the middle, the leader of it, more of his Panjshiri Tajik groups. And in the back, over on the right, you can see the top of a military cap of a defected uh, general and General Rashid Dustum had just defected from the Ministry of Defense in Kabul, which pretty much was the death knell for the regime at that time, 1992. And this, two weeks later, they attacked Kabul, and this meeting was to decide on which ministries and which intersections, which buildings that they were going to take over. And it actually worked. So this is the takeover of Kabul protecting a, a strategic intersection. These are Uzbek militia. You'll notice the fellow on the left has no shoes. Nothing seemed to phase them. We often thought that they had green blood. They were fearless. And they're keeping out a Pashtun rival, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, another warlord. This is the only victory celebration image that I could really muster up from my files, and then the following day, civil war bro broke out. So in 1993, which was a really bad year for civilians in Kabul, trying to get food, water, or your kids to school, if the schools were open, meant dodging bullets. The front line was about 800 yards away, but this civilian was caught, and he's being taken across by uh, a policeman and another civilian. Typical joyriding of government troops with a Soviet vehicle in 1993. One thing that really uh, exposed me to the internal workings of South Asia, in particular uh, Afghanistan, was the fighting for particular neighborhoods in Kabul mountain to mountain, the Shia on one side and the Sunnis on the other. And these are Sunni civilians leaving shelling that's going on mountain to mountain. And this is pretty much what you take when you leave. A bicycle, a teacup, a chicken, and basically your life and get out. And eventually they would go back. But this was a normal situation in the period of civil war, which is chapter two in the book. Gasoline would come in from Pakistan, and the uncooperative warlord Gulbuddin Hekmatyar would often cut the road for gasoline and food supplies, so there was very little gasoline, and this is a normal morning of people trying to go to work in a Russian vehicle. There's well over 20 people on that. A widow with her family. This was downtown, which has now been totally rebuilt in Kabul. The front line, the enemy at this point was down at the end of this street, which meant Arabs, Pakistanis, and Afghans opposed to the government. 
and this was a lull in the action, usually around noon, and boys uh, fetching water for the soldiers. Now, the front line was complicated to get to. This was an easy day to get down by car, and a lot of what I did in this type of situation was due to the experienced driver or fixer that we had, and you can see his yellow car here. This group of uh, frontline soldiers started an argument with another group of four guys. They were complaining that the other group stole their television that they had looted. So the way arguments were settled back then is that the rifle was just lowered and this poor guy being carried away was shot in the stomach. They came after our car to try to get him to the hospital. He was already dead. But fortunately, the uh, driver was smart enough to put a kill switch, which is a, a, an electrical switch underneath the dashboard, which even though the car would turn over, would never get the spark to the engine. So they left his car alone and took the boy or that man away in a wheelbarrow. These were typical frontline soldiers stoned out of their minds. And uh, this was right downtown Kabul. On a day in 1993, I, I still haven't been able to find the person I went out with that day on how I found these bodies of Shia uh, militiamen who had been executed and dumped behind a clinic. This is uh, one of the mountains that they were often fighting over. You can see neighborhoods that go up part of the way of the mountain, but these people were taken probably from over in this area and executed and dumped here. It's still a crime that's been filed in Geneva, International Court of Criminal Justice, and will never really be resolved. But this gives you an idea of what's happening today in Syria and what happened already in Afghanistan. This begins the third chapter of the Taliban taking over in 1996. <coughs> They're firing rockets at the retreating government soldiers of Ahmad Shah Massoud, north of the capital. This is a mad mullah who is explaining to Kabul residents what it means now to be under the control of the Taliban. Beards will be grown, turbans will be worn, shops will be closed during prayer time, girl schools will be closed, no unaccompanied female will be allowed in the public, basically reading them the riot act. It's a Kandahari coming to Kabul, their traditional enemies. And there's one foreigner in here. Where's Waldo? Right there. This is what the Taliban did to a university outside of Kandahar. We jumped to 2001. There was a, a vast famine up in the northwest of Afghanistan. And a lot of families came down to Herat, which is on the Iran-Afghan border in the west. And at that time, the Taliban, in February of 2001, had kept all UN supplies, roofing material, blankets, medicine, food, all supplies that the UNICEF or any UN program would try to offer people fleeing from a famine, kept it away, and the baby died due to exposure. And this is the family walking on the way to the cemetery. It's traditional. This is the father here on the left. Each male member would carry the body for three, four, or five minutes and hand it off to the next. So this is February of 2001. Things are getting increasingly tense with journalists and UN staff. In May of 2001, a reporter and I went up to northern, Pakistan, uh, sorry, northern Afghanistan to Takar, Badakhshan, and met Ahmad Shah Massoud to figure out how he was paying for being able to control just 10% of what was left of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda and the Taliban at this point had 90% control of Afghanistan. He was uh, using smuggled lapis lazuli and smuggled emeralds to pay. He 
it, it's the oldest lapis mine in the world, which is in his part of the country in Badakhshan. And that would eventually get to Dubai. Uh, and the emeralds would be sold wherever he could get them out. And the Russians were also supplying him with petrol through Tajikistan. And the Iranians were somehow getting funds to him too. So we combine this with the time period, May of 2001. It's just four months away from 9-11. He knew something was going on in Kandahar with Al-Qaeda. The United States had made certain overtures to him, particularly the CIA, that never really wanted to back a Tajik, ethnic Tajik. We had 95% of the backing for the Pashtuns, and that's through Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, preference, and the United States blindly went along with it. So he represented the last hope and on September 9th, you'll remember he was killed, assassinated, and two days later, 9-11 happened. So in November of 2001, 9-11 had, had already happened. The bombing started in early October, U.S. and NATO bombing. I was lucky enough to get a visa to go to Kandahar with the Taliban who wanted to show us the destruction from U.S. bombing. And that's also the cover of the book as part of this trip. But just a handful of us had permission to go with the Taliban. You could see they were not happy to see a bunch of foreigners. And Afghans at this point really don't distinguish Americans, French, German, Canada, or Brazilian for that matter. It's just that we represented what came out of the sky at night. And they were being pushed out. A lot of these people are Taliban. You won't see any females out. Some of them are not soldiers, but we had security all around us and, and on the rooftop. In December of 2001, I was working with the New York Times and with a reporter, we found four Pakistanis among many prisoners who had been taken by the Northern Alliance, which then had taken over Kabul. They were uh, trained in Pakistan uh, they're from Jaish Mohammed, which is similar to this group some of you may have heard of, Lashkari Toiba, who's responsible for the Mumbai killing. These are madrasa trained by ISI and military soldiers and sent across into Afghanistan to fight. They were captured. Um, they did express some sorrow. You can tell that they have that very sorrowful face, but uh, they were unfortunate enough not to get away and they were probably interrogated by the Americans and sent back to Pakistan. If they're alive, they're doing exactly what they were trained to do back in 2001. This is an Arab caught up on Tora Bora where bin Laden had been hiding out before he escaped. Fifteen guys stayed behind for numerous uh, days and weeks of heavy bombing. You can see the sort of shell-shocked look on this fellow. This was not anything we had asked for. It's illegal technically by the Geneva Convention to display prisoners, but they basically, the Afghans here in eastern Afghanistan near Jalalabad sold these uh, prisoners back to the Americans and ended up in Guantanamo. So in 2002, after uh, landing a bunch of soldiers, this is fellows from the 10th Mountain Division, to push out the remaining Arabs and Taliban in the center of the country, we came across at 5,500 feet, really difficult terrain, particularly for soldiers carrying 90 to 100 pound packs, uh, some dead Taliban. I noticed in the picture after uh, looking at it very closely, two sets of white gloves. You can see one set here and one over there. And I noticed the, his fingertips of the dead soldier had blue ink on it. And I noticed another set of gloves straight above it. So the forensic team had been through and took his fingerprints. But the maggots had already gotten to the skull, so I, it was a bit difficult to um, take this picture. But by going to that angle, I actually then noticed some interesting things. 
So part of the uh, push for me in the book was to include as many of the surrounding countries and their influence in Afghanistan. There are six countries that surround Afghanistan and they all have a part. They all play a role. The great game continues uh, from the 19th century. And while Pakistan said there were no Afghan uh, Taliban in Pakistan, these are Afghan Taliban in Quetta, Balochistan. You can see they know what I know, that I know what they are, who they are. And the guide that I was with, a Baluch uh, in Quetta, was then later that day approached by ISI and told not to be showing the foreigners the Afghans. But during the winter months, similar to now, they would take refuge in Pakistan and then in the spring go back and fight. It's about an hour's drive to the border with Afghanistan. In 2006, I went up to Nuristan with the 10th Mountain Division. It's a very remote and difficult uh, geographically uh, part of the Hindu Kush, and here again, 10th Mountain Division was in a, uh, a very strange, very low position. They were peppered constantly from the high altitudes of uh, Hindu Kush by guerrillas or Taliban, actually rent a soldier. And th these fellows were ambushed on their way up to resupply a camp on top of the mountain. They were fine. They had some uh, shrapnel in their foreheads, but nothing uh, critical. And the one fellow behind here caught some shrapnel in, in his shoulder. But uh, a year later, this base was abandoned and overrun. Our man in Kabul, Zalmay Halilzad, the U.S. ambassador, a uh, strange fellow, part of the neocon group of Kissinger and boys. And here he's visiting Kandahar Airport, which was built in the 50s by the Americans, surrounded by a security team from DynCor, very similar to Blackwater, if you remember that group. And here he's going to do a ribbon cutting of a new road that was opened with AID funds. This gives you an idea of what the terrain was like in the Hindu Kush. This is in Kunar province. That's about close to 6,000 feet. U.S. Marines had a base in Asadabad. Formidable terrain, particularly when you're carrying about 40 to 50 pounds of gear. The other fellow in Kabul, Hamid Karzai, which I think is every time he opens his mouth these days, it's great for me, but it also reminds you of what a difficult place Afghanistan is. This is in 2009 press conference. So this is what we're leaving behind. These are Afghan National Police in a pr provincial district outpost. This is our brand new Ford pickup truck without any gasoline because it's been stolen all the way down into the remote areas, it never makes it. You can see there's a very modern HESCO wall up top, which are sand-filled barricades, dirty socks hanging, Afghan flag, Russian or Chinese rooftop to a vehicle, a broken chair, and their true Afghan hospitality asking us in for breakfast. Gives you an idea of what it looks like to be a soldier or a local. This is outside of Kabul in Wardak province. In 2009, I did four embeds, which really broke me by the end of the year. And it was 125 degrees in Helmand, about 80 miles from the Pakistan border in the desert in a 16th century fort. The Marine, US Marines show up, and this is after a patrol at five in the afternoon. Strangely enough, the fellow wearing, these two guys wearing do-rags were reprimanded by a sergeant major in the Pentagon for being out of uniform after this picture was published. And with the sweat pouring off of your face, considering the heat, I mean, a do-rag is the least they could allow them, but when the picture was published, 
the absurdity of a desk jockey telling them really what they can wear. Nothing really happened to them, but I was uh, told that this is one of the effects of having a picture published. This gives you an idea again of the Hindu Kush, the mountains in eastern Afghanistan, the remote areas, and in 2009 I had a helicopter ride with a colonel that was coming in to take over this area. Most of these small bases were, were given up, just being impossible to resupply. It's a group of Marines looking for a farmer's possible uh, fertilizer bomb making room. Fertilizer and diesel fuel makes what a very lethal device called an IED. But it was determined by this explosive ordnance group that uh, the farmer was, was not doing that. It just gives you an I idea of how they try to track everything down and usually miss it. So in 2013, I returned to see what the new cobble was all about. And this is a wedding hall, very much like the architecture of Dubai, which is a, a place that the Afghans love to flock to. This is a hall that can hold four giant weddings. This is really what Afghans want in life, is to be able to go out at night. There's no curfew now. Things may very well change in the next couple of years, but normal life for them. This is Kabul in May of 2013. And probably in another couple of years, this green space will not be there. It's a, it's a city that roughly could hold half a million people. It now has close to six million. Kabul University is this green area in the midpoint. And development is, is moving, real estate development. That's the Kabul River that's running through. And on my last day, on, on May 16th, after I paid my hotel bill at 9 in the morning, I got word that there had been a suicide car bomb. And this was a, a Chevrolet Suburban SUV carrying four uh, Army trainers killed. And two others in another car was also blown up, along with 10 Afghans. So the car bomb phenomena continues. These guys probably went on the street too many times, and a pattern set in. So the first slide is the Soviets leaving, and this is uh, army soldiers leaving from Bagram Air Base, no weapons, sort of the, uh, the look of, if you can see that they're all looking at the soldiers coming in on the right to finish out their deployment. They're going home and will stay away. Bagram has 30,000 people at the airport. It's enormous. And it's one of the bases the US does not want to give up. This is the last slide, and it shows what a typical day around a traffic circle in a market in Western Kabul is like. Gridlock, noise, dust, chaos, but this is what Afghans want. Really, they want normal life, markets to be open, free of violence, and their ability to purchase whatever they want whenever they want it. They don't often have a voice in the matter. It's still controlled very much by warlords. And now the politics of withdrawal and all that involves. So with that, I would uh, I conclude the slideshow and be happy to take any questions that you may have. <clears throat> What's the future after the Americans leave? Al-Qaeda take over? Uh, will the uh, Taliban take over? They'll take over certain parts of the country, particularly around the periphery near the Pakistan-Iran border. They're very likely to come in with deals being struck with the government. So they don't fight, but just turn it over. They still have a lot of influence 
in those regions. Most of the Taliban are from those regions. But the cities will be kept in control of the government. They'll become islands at some point. But after that, really, no one has any idea. But Al-Qaeda is waiting to see what happens. <coughs> yes, ma'am. I can photograph freely 50% of the population. Uh, anything I do on the streets really is almost, for my long time in the country, gratuitous, really, to represent females. Um, I thought I had a slide of, of school children crossing the street, girl schools. Girl schools are open. It's difficult to get in there with a camera. It's much easier for a female photographer to do it. And there's a lot of hospitality shown for females that want to do it. They feel more comfortable with that. Um, but for so long, I, I'd have a strict agenda. And if someone said, OK, now we want to show the improvement for, for women in Afghanistan, I could do it very topically or superficially. But really, that intimate day-to-day -day story of uh, you can go 10 years as a male and never meet an Afghan's wife, never. That's just the tradition. There are some that will offer to shake your hand, but you usually keep your hands in the back when you're presenting. It's, it's the whole tradition and the customs that you have to be aware of. But um, yes, in the book I do, I was very conscious of that editing, that we had enough balance. But it, it, it's difficult as a male. And it's difficult for a female, too. And it, it's going to go on that way for a long time. And a lot of the Afghans are very, um, not angry, but frustrated about the way Western culture is trying to force them to change their ways, particularly dealing with women. Women, in a lot of ways, in parts of the world, are considered real estate. And arranged marriages are still very much part of uh, life in Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, in many places. And for us to tell them what to do, uh, it often falls on deaf ears and makes them very agitated. But certainly, girls' schools have opened up. Clinics, nurses, hospitals now have women treating males, which the Taliban did not permit. So there, there has been progress. But as a male with a camera, uh, it, it puts the women in an awkward position, too, for me to say, oh, well, I want to follow you around for the day. That's very difficult. But it can be done. Yes, ma'am. You talked about the car bombing on May 16th. And I heard the word pattern, but I didn't catch the rest of the sentence. I don't know if you're going to remember what you were saying, but I know you were pre the pre sentence. But um, is there something about a pattern? I'm not sure what that connection was. There was a training base that they would go out to twice a week, three times a week. And Americans. I'm not being cynical here, are very dumb. Why would you have a Chevrolet SUV when everybody else is driving a lower profile car? It, the only people that would be driving a Chevrolet Suburban would be Americans. They're a target, unfortunately. But that's the way it is. And our embassy uses black Chevrolet Suburbans. Why don't you just make them day glow orange, you know? But they knew their pattern. There probably weren't many other roads to this training facility, about three miles away. And they don't have a convoy with security in front. They pretty much go on their own. And they were waiting for them. There could have been another car bomb two blocks away on a street that they didn't use. But at that point, they knew they were going that, that route. So 10 Afghans were killed along with the six Americans. You had quite a few pictures of uh, Haqqani and some other kind of uh, higher, uh, higher echelon type uh, figures in the Afghan life. And I'm wondering if your access to some of those people changed after in 2001. Uh, oh, yes. Was killed Absolutely. By a journalist camera that, that it, it changed after Clinton tried to bomb those bases after our embassies were bombed in Africa. 
two Pakistanis went down to those bases from Kabul, two, two Pakistani photographers, the day after those cruise missiles landed. And the Arabs were burying their dead. They were not happy to see them. They thought that they had, and they had a, uh, a satellite phone, which the Arabs thought were tracking devices. So they accused them of being part of, this is 1997. This is how we moved pictures. You scan it and send it. They put one fellow's, they smashed the cameras. They put one fellow's palm on top of the car and smashed it with the rifle butt. Broke his fingers. Um, that was the reception in that area that we used to have access to. Once the Arabs got in there and started controlling it, the Afghans sort of pulled aside and let the Arabs control it. So we had no access to that area from late 90s on. And drones are the only thing that can get to it now. But it makes a big difference on how we work. If, you, if even the local can't go down there, it makes it much more difficult. And the consequences are real. There will always be a stupid traveler. Even going out in the winter here is considered sometimes crazy, but you have a pretty high tolerance for winter here. But um, those areas now are off limits and have been for a long time. Yes, ma'am. Since I lived there for so long in, in New Delhi and traveled frequently, even on my own when I wasn't on assignment, I kept in regular touch and still do. Um, it's important for me to be able to generate images which inform as well as illustrate daily life. And I rely a lot on the contacts that I've made for 20 years including the drivers, whose sons and nephews now I'm using when I do go back. They're trusted, and they trust me, and that's really all I have uh, when I work in civilian populations. I don't go around with a flak jacket. I don't carry any of that unless I'm with the military. But you, you do have to find people you feel you can work with, and it's not just for the money, but it's their lives also that are at risk if they're caught in the wrong place, if I'm caught in the wrong place. So you try to get uh, a group of people around you that speak the language, ethnically diverse, or understand the humor involved in trying to lie at a checkpoint. I mean, that all goes into it. And I keep a straight face. And if we get through, we keep working. If I get frustrated, he's frustrated, the job's not really that fruitful anymore. But, you know, I'm paying them over $100 a day to drive and, inter and translate. Whereas a reporter needs a driver and a translator. That's much more unwieldy, actually. I try to separate myself to have my own people that know what photographers need. Writers have different needs, want to stop constantly, talk here, talk here, and, and leaves me doing different work. So it's a good question, but in all of the places, particularly in South Asia, you know who to contact in each place before you go in. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about how you feel your approach to photojournalism differs from that of other photojournalists who have been working in Afghanistan over the same time? And, and could you maybe tell us something also about uh, how the demand for your images has changed over the last decade in terms of the publications and agencies you've worked for. Uh, you, know, you see the role of the still photographs still be what it was. I was fortunate enough to live in the region to be based there for Time Magazine. Uh, it gave me different access. I could 
I, did, I wasn't a fireman, so to speak, coming, coming in two, three days after an event. Uh, and there, were, there still are a few who are working, kicking around in the area. Some British actually have more interest than, and very few Americans at this point because it's very expensive increasingly so, to live there. Uh, there. And fewer publications and organizations sending people there, willing to take on the risk of insurance. Now, keep in mind, when Katie Couric or some VIP type person from 60 Minutes goes over there, the insurance starts kicking as soon as they take off. And that could be $10,000 a day insurance for them. Same for me working for the New York Times or Time Magazine, you have to have that infrastructure. All organizations, the Chicago Tribune is one of them, have, have pulled back. And they will take freelancers at half the fee. Um, I sometimes see, because of subscriptions now through photo agencies, NBC will buy Getty Images pictures by the year, and I will only, I'll get maybe $1.17 for an image, where I used to be getting $125 for the same image. This seriously limits anybody from journalism school or with the wanderlust to go into this profession now, because the return just isn't there. And it's a different business model. So to set up shop in Kabul, there are some. Uh, to pay rent, about $1,500 a month, plus vehicle, plus food, plus interpreter. It, it really, it's still a lot of money. The costs have risen, and the income return has lessened. Uh, the stills, still images would re really, to make it viable, need sound. For instance, I put together a, an audio slideshow, and also video has to come into it. But one suffers if you do too many of these things. It's hard to be an expert in stills, audio, and video. You need a good editor at $100 an hour. And to do a three, four minute piece could take you four or five hours. Where are you going to get the $500 return as a freelance? And remember, I was a contract person, but I was also freelance. I paid my own health. I paid my own rent. I didn't have the same benefit of a staff person. It's a long answer to your question, but it's increasingly difficult. NPR still has people moving around. I think the Chicago Tribune may have somebody in the region. But then again, a lot of their trips are not uh, green-lighted anymore because each trip out is expensive. So they'll do things by phone. It's a different landscape now. And I think a lot of people who consume information are also somewhat frustrated by that. Yes, ma'am. I know this might not necessarily be your area, but I was wondering, um, during the time that you spent in Afghanistan, might, if you got to speak to you know, young people or teenagers, if they had a different sort of sense of what their country was and in the place that they were growing up, given that basically if they're under 20, they've lived in a very different I have spoken to a handful, primarily university students now. Um, their whole past has been one of violence and anxiety, split families, displaced, uh, but they take it in stride. Whether that's normal for them, I think it is. But without the, prior to this, in 1992, you still had the infrastructure of the Communist Party there. So if you were a Communist Party official, you got better apartments, you had better access to, not, to propane or rations or a placement for your children in school. But once things got really chaotic and the Mujahideen came in, those people had to flee and that infrastructure collapsed. No. So what's, what's happening now is reconstruction entirely of the country. And it's very difficult to do that under war circumstances. War wipes away all progress, including things that we've put in place. I think they're hopeful, 
but they're also very tolerant of violence. How many funerals have they been to? How many uncles have gone missing, people killed? Uh, and remember, a lot of these pictures that I took from the early days of before 9-11 don't exist in their archives. Gone, destroyed. And home scrapbooks were also destroyed. Because if you, were, if you had to flee the country and you were caught with your family scrapbook, if it met up at the wrong checkpoint, it might have somebody in, in a Communist Party uniform. Or it's, somebody knew about your uncle was a provincial official. So all that stuff was trashed. And it really, they, they're just, they're completely rebuilding their country. But they're all wired for the internet. They're anxious for the latest cell phone from Dubai or Pakistan. That's really, they want a car, they want an apartment, they want these things. They're much more aware, but they also realize there's a glass ceiling. Yes, sir. Um, I think we'd need a good hour to answer that. And they themselves don't know why. Other than they claim strategic depth. They want Pashtuns who are compliant to their way and not India's way to block India. Which seems increasingly odd because India really could care less. Um, but that's been their MO for a long time is to block India and to have Pashtuns that are on one side of the border and on the other side of the border compliant, you create chaos and therefore you can control it. But the Madrasa thing has come back to hurt them. And it's my opinion, it's an awful legacy that started in the 80s. And it's, the Saudis are also playing around, trying to block Iranian influence. And it, it's true to this day that the Saudis are plugging around Afghanistan and Pakistan to make sure that they can train people and send them to Syria and to block Iran on the other side. It's, it's, they, they're playing it, and it's called the great game. And they don't care. But I think the Pakistanis... Uh, don't get me going on this, but um, I saw it so often blundering al along with uh, short-term goals that would come back to haunt them. But uh, they're going to continue. Yes, sir. I know what you're talking about sort of brought up something in, in general about Afghanistan is I mean, are all the borders of the country artificial in the sense that they ever follow any historical or ethnic divisions? Because you talk about Tajiks and Uzbeks, and they not only have their own countries, and I guess the Pashta or, or how they're on both sides. And, you know, so is it just a total mess ethnically in, in that whole region? Um, in the north, in Central Asia, you have rivers, perhaps, that act as borders. So there are natural borders to, to a certain extent, but the ethnic uh, overflow continues no matter what period of time you're talking about. And that Durand line between Afghanistan and Pakistan is, is not agreed upon. So it's more of a family tie than a, a nationalistic attachment. Borders for them means that they have to smuggle and they're expert smugglers. They're land pirates. And that fellow Haqqani that I had a picture of, any truck that goes into that part of Afghanistan for anything, wood, gasoline, food, washing machines, stolen vehicles, drugs, whatever, he collects a bit of that. So borders represent opportunities as well as strategic challenges. So it's a mix, and if you're a board, if you're sent out to cover as a border or uh, border official, 
You're not there because you're following orders. You're there to make money. So it, it's, it's a little bit more counterintuitive, really. What you talk about borders for them are ways to make money, or it's different. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about like the Taliban, right? Um, up in here in America, we hear about people. You know, there's a Taliban attack here, or uh, Americans are going for a Taliban base here. But how much of these fighters actually are part of specific groups? How many of them are just sort of locals who just are kind of following like a little, like a like a self defense? Oh, this is my village or my valley that I can protect against these invaders, whoever they might be, Russians, Americans, communists. Um, and like, is it really like a sort of, is it really that sort of amount of like um, organized um, resistance, or is it more just like local? It's both. Uh, very often the locals have been bombed, or there's some tribal dispute that got turned around and works against them. Karzai's tribe is on top right now, and a lot of people re re resent that. And this, it's, it's a way of getting back at them. So it, it depends on the area, it depends on the town, the province, the valley. And if one person is killed in a family, they'll take revenge and they'll join the Taliban. It's the only way that they can oppose something too. It's not very practical, but it's the only game in town. They can't go to the police, they can't go to the courts, they can't go to the capital. But it also represents a failure of the, the government itself to be able to uh, represent the people. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, what advice would you have for young aspiring photojournalists? Get a plane ticket and go. Take your chances. And you have to learn how to gamble even when you get there. But the gamble starts at whether or not you're going to plunk money down for a plane ticket. It's not as simple as that, obviously. But um, I'd say become very diverse in your approach to journalism. Master video, master audio, master stills, master writing as much as you can. Have good business cards, have good follow-up, have write a lot of thank you notes, just be very persistent. But it is a new business model. And if you're curious, buy good maps, read a lot of books, not just contemporary, but I do have a quote from Winston Churchill. It reminds me, 1897, I think Churchill was about 22 years old, and he went to present-day Pakistan and watched. And he was a reporter. And they were still using swords and muskets then and bayonets. So he said, financially it is ruinous, morality is, it is wicked, morally it is wicked, militarily it is an open question, and politically it is a blunder. That was before Al-Qaeda. Uh, it's a very difficult area and there's a lot to learn. I was blessed with an opportunity to sit and watch in all these countries and absorb it, keep my mouth shut. You're going to make mistakes. But you better get it right in a very sensitive area where you have different ethnic groups, different tribes, different emotions, and different reasons for their anger, not, not similar to what we would have as far as solving these problems. You have to be attuned to that. And for me, this place is the perfect mix of chaos and content. Figure out violence. How does it work? What motivates people? It, you, you, we are always geared towards figuring out peace and how to obtain it, but also what motivates people to become violent. We have time for just one more question. Okay. Who would like to ask it? Yes, ma'am. I moved from Thailand, from Bangkok, where Time had a bureau. And the photographer that had been in New Delhi left, and uh, the window opened. Do you want to go? 
I said yes. Uh, personally, living there back then was very difficult. Everything had to be smuggled. I had to leave the country to get film. I had to leave the country to get camera gear. Anything I had to bring. Even ketchup and mustard wasn't available in India. Good pasta wasn't available. <laughs> I mean, these are very high priorities, you know. But um, every 100 days I'd have to leave too because it was just too chaotic. And that was the reason I, t I took it on. I had very good reporters and news was, uh, you know, film took 24 hours to reach New York. No film was processed in India. I'd have to find pigeons taking human pigeons to get film out, keep my fingers crossed. Uh, it, was it was difficult, but the rewards were there. You could figure out in advance what the news would be, or at least know what the front page of the story would be the day before. Things were evolving. Kashmir was a mess. Sri Lanka was a mess. Martial law in Bangladesh, martial law in Pakistan, perfect ingredients to go and investigate. Constantly on edge, constantly without power. You'd have to book phone calls from India to the United States one hour and wait. And then you could hear the tape machine in the background. Things were so rudimentary, reel-to-reel -reel tapes. They were, it was hilarious. You're taping me. Not only that, but I can hear your tape. <laughs> this thing was Snowden, I could, you know, for me. It's been going on for 30 years, I've been taped. What, am I, what are they going to hear from me? A waybill number about my film? Well, you know, big deal. And a reporter, if they're stupid enough to be saying these things over the line, you know, there's now a whole way of encryption, whatever you have for your information, but this region was very rich, it still is. It's just three times as costly to be there, unfortunately. Or fortunately for people who are developing the place, but that's the way it is. Journalism has come down as far as the number of people involved in the profession. We have somebody here, from former Chicago Tribune reporter and editor, and we, all, we could see it coming, but uh, Choice is what you want to maintain as a freelancer. If your staff, they own the picture, they own the copyright, they own your equipment, the copyright's mine, the computer's mine, but the expense is mine too. So you have to decide it's worth it. Well, Mr. Nicholsberg will be uh, available for further conversation, and his book is available for sale here at the Center at Club Bookstore, and he will also, I'm sure, be happy to sign it, uh, should you be interested in purchasing a copy. Uh, but why don't we give a round of applause to thank you. Thank you. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.